Hi, and welcome to my channel. My name is Pluto, and I'm here today to talk about pill shaming. By day, I'm a licensed therapist, and so I talk to a lot of people about what works for them and what doesn't work for them when it comes to their mental health, and that includes medications. I don't prescribe medications, but people will often bring their concerns to me about whether or not their meds are working and how to approach those conversations with their doctors and other prescribers. Before we dive into this video, I want to give the disclaimer that this video is not intended to be individual professional advice for anyone, right? This is me sharing some different perspectives that are happening in the world and my thoughts on those. If you need advice specific to you, especially medical advice, please seek out a doctor or other licensed professional. If you're experiencing life-threatening symptoms, I'll list some resources below that you can utilize to get support. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, I'm here to talk about pill shaming. This is a term that has been thrown around a lot and I'm here to break it down. Simply put, pill shaming is when someone uh, gives someone unsolicited advice about their mental health condition by telling them that they shouldn't take medication, that they're lazy or weak or insert other adjective here for needing to take pills for their mental health. I've been wanting to make a video about pill shaming for some time. I've seen the memes on the internet, and I recently read an article by Sarah Davidow and Carolyn Mazel Carlton. This article broke down the phenomenon of pill shaming, including the two positions that I'm going to share with you today. And I think it's a really good read if you're interested in learning more about this, and I'm going to reference some of the ideas throughout my talk today. As I was reading their article, I was excited for someone to put into words the things that I've been thinking about because the pill shaming phenomenon has made me uncomfortable. Because on one hand, I want people to try alternatives to medication because it has a lot of negative side effects and it doesn't always work for everyone. And at the same time, I want people to feel as though it's safe and okay for them to take medication and be out about that in society. To start, I'm going to break down the two main places that the media identifies as pill shaming, the two main camps that one might uh, associate this term with. Position number one. This is someone that might be a bit on the earthy crunchy side and maybe they see a friend struggling with depression, struggling with bipolar disorder. They're just like, oh, well, if you spent more time in the sunshine and you ate lots of kale and you just, you know, went to yoga five days a week, you would feel totally great and you wouldn't have any problems, obviously. This viewpoint tends to be dismissive of mental health in general, and I would also associate it with the spiritual bypass term, right, where it's like, oh, if I just focus on the positive, everything will be positive. And unfortunately, that doesn't really work in the real world, right? We can only be in denial about our shadow side for so long before it comes to haunt us. Generally speaking, these individuals are providing their oh-so-glorious opinion unsolicited, meaning that no one asked for it, no one wanted it, but they're gonna give it anyway. The sentences will start with, if you would just... Probably one of the world's most unhelpful sentences, if we're being honest. Really, this viewpoint way oversimplifies mental health, saying that, you know, if you just had these healthy habits, if you just ate more vegetables, then you would be fine, then you would always be happy, then you wouldn't have any problems, insert fantasy here. It's easy to assume that this viewpoint is problematic because they are anti-pill. Right? That's what the name implies, pill shaming. We're shaming you because you need pills and you shouldn't need pills, you should just need sunshine. But this is about more than that, right? This, this particular brand of pill shaming is really not about pills. To me, it's about a discomfort with mental illness, suffering, the shadow side of the psyche, it's more of that, you know, we want to stay in the light, fluffy side of things, and we don't like it when you talk about stuff that makes us uncomfortable or is messy or confusing or painful. So really, this isn't about pills at all. This is about us not wanting to face the misery that sometimes occurs as part of the human condition. 
it's much easier to dismiss it to say, well, you know, you're just not being positive enough. You're not eating enough blueberries and quinoa. Like, it's so much easier to just blame the victim again, right? So remember that term about blaming the victim. Okay, position number two. So this one is generally seen as people that we might use the term anti-psychiatry, right? And then this is someone saying, you know, I didn't need pills or I recovered without pills with other means. And therefore, you know, the implicit assumption of the statement is that, well, you shouldn't need pills either. We're going to come back to that. Other people that get called pill shamers are folks that talk a lot about the negative side effects of psychiatric medications or who speak out about the human rights abuses that have occurred throughout history and, and still today, if we're being really honest, in the psychiatry system. At face value, it may seem that this second viewpoint in particular, you're like, well, those people shouldn't be bullying other people into not wanting to take their pills. But is it really pill shaming? to tell someone, hey, I'm concerned because this medication has some really serious long-term side effects. There's a really great group of people that are, you know, looking at different alternatives to how we define mental illness, how we work with people in extreme states called the Icarus Project. And if you go onto the Icarus Project forums or Facebook groups, you will encounter some people who genuinely believe that psychiatric medications are pure evil and no good can come of them. Right. And that we might really be able to distill as like the essence of, you know, pill shaming is someone being like, you know, no one should ever take these. You're buying into a corrupt system if you do. You're selling out if you do. But that's a really, really small minority of people. Like position number one, when we examine position number two a little bit deeper, it quickly breaks apart. This one even more so than the first one. Because ultimately, it's kind of a straw man. Most people, even if they are advocating for change in the mental health system, don't believe that pills are always bad and no one should ever take them. When we talk about oppression in our society, right, there's always a power dynamic. So there's someone who's doing the oppressing and someone who's being oppressed. And the person who's doing the oppressing has systems at their disposal, like the government, the police, the court system, the legislature, right? And they're able to utilize all those resources to get their opinions, their ideas, their perspectives out there and seen as the dominant thing. Much like reverse racism, pill shaming flies in the face of the traditional power structure. Because if we look at things, right, there is no power structure that backs up this position of pill shaming. In fact, there's a power structure that enforces pill taking. <laughs> You may or may not be aware, but when it comes to psychiatric medications, depending on what state you live in, a court can order you to take a medication. They can utilize force to make you comply with that order. They can do blood tests to prove that you are or are not complying with your medication order. There's also Big Pharma, right, who is lobbying. Uh, there's been really direct evidence that Big Pharma has lobbied to have certain research hidden because it would hurt their sales of antidepressants. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a whole power system that enforces psychiatric med compliance. So the term pill shaming kind of doesn't make sense when we look at it in the larger, wider world. The police aren't going to show up at your door because you took your psychiatric meds. However, they could show up at your door if you don't take your psychiatric meds and someone deems you sick enough to not be able to make that choice on your own. People that are on disability, they can potentially lose their disability if they decide to stop taking psychiatric medications and pursue alternative methods of treatment because the person arbitrating that decision may decide that because they're not on their meds, they're no longer considered sick. While there are certainly instances of people not being able to pay for their psychiatric medications due to lack of insurance, there are many, many more instances where people in the system who are in poverty are denied other methods of treatment and forced onto medication in the exclusion of other treatments because the meds are cheaper than, say, family or in-home family therapy or other methods that would need to be employed. This is particularly common for children in the foster system who are often heavily medicated and not provided at times with more uh, gentle therapies that involve, you know, in-person talking. 
the more that we look at this problem, it seems to me that pill shaming is not really the real issue. Our society doesn't want to sit with the uncomfortable parts of mental health, the uncomfortable pieces of our psyches. The systems that are in power actually enforce people in terms of med compliance rather than the other way around. There are many people in our society who don't want to be on medications, who don't feel helped by medications, but who are forced to take them by regulatory bodies in their communities. We need to ask if pill shaming is really the real problem here. The truth of the matter is that sharing information about psychiatric medications and challenging the biomedical narrative that mental illness is entirely about a chemical imbalance is very threatening to the system. It's threatening to the pharmaceutical industry, it's threatening to medical lobbies, it's threatening to the prison industry, and a number of other parties. So when people start to challenge that, there's an easy way to discredit them, and that's to turn them into the bullies in the narrative. And I believe that that's what happens when we look at this pill shaming narrative. Because when we say, oh, you know, I'm sharing information with you about the dangers of psychiatric medications or giving you more, more information so that you can have informed consent, if we flip that around and say, oh, well, now you're, you're bullying someone, you're, you're saying that they shouldn't take their medication and that, you know, they're weak for needing to do so, that's, that's a spin. That's not really the intention there. The pill shaming concept is in many ways a clever way to discredit dissent about mental illness, especially those that disagree with the biomedical narrative. It turns info sharing into bullying. Many mental health advocates, including myself, find it incredibly ironic that people think they're being woke by telling people it's okay to take their medications. Encouraging someone to do something that the system mandates that they do isn't a counterculture thing. <laughs> It doesn't mean it's inherently wrong or bad, but the system is absolutely stacked to convince people to take psychiatric medication to the exclusion of other forms of treatment, even though the research does not entirely support that hypothesis. Today, more people are on psychiatric medications than have ever been in human history. Let's consider the pros and cons of psychiatric meds. Sometimes they can be life-saving. There are people who use them and their life is changed because of it and they're able to function in a way that they were not before and they literally feel that those medications have saved their lives. Many people benefit from psychiatric medications because of the placebo effect. The studies on antidepressants show that they have about similar efficacy to a placebo pill. So even if someone isn't actually receiving literal physical benefit, the belief that they're doing something to help themselves sometimes is enough to actually help them. For some individuals, having a little chemical assistance um, that allows them to have a little more energy or feel a little more functional will give them the space that they need in order to do more work to be in a better place. Also, psychiatric medications are cheaper than therapy and other forms of treatment. Now for the cons. There are a lot of side effects, and I think it's easy to be dismissive of the side effects. I hear this a lot in the field where a family member says, you know, I know their medications have side effects, but if they would just take them, everything would be fine. The truth is that for some people, the side effects are very serious, including irreversible movement disorders, diabetes, not feeling like yourself, erectile dysfunction, inability to orgasm. You know, these are not small things. So if someone says that the side effects of their medications are causing a problem, there's a good chance they're right about that. There are multiple psychiatric medications which require you to get regular blood tests done because they can cause damage to vital organs if not monitored correctly. I don't say any of that to scare people into not taking the medications. I just think that it's important that people understand the risks of what they're getting into, right? You can look at what does this treatment offer me? What are the risks of this treatment? And I'm going to make an informed decision with all the information. To this day, there is a lack of proper research about how these medications work, why it is they work, and what it is they even address in the first place there still is no real evidence that mental illness is caused by a chemical imbalance. We know that a chemical imbalance can be created during the course of the mental illness, but we don't know 
that that's what it is that starts the ball rolling. It's my professional opinion that people should be able to choose the treatment that is going to work best for them. Along with that, it's essential that our society provide equitable access to different forms of treatment. This fight isn't about pills, it's about choice. I always tell my patients, you need to do what's going to help you. If you find that there's a pill that helps make your life better, great, do that. If you find that craniosacral therapy or acupuncture or yoga or meditation helps you, awesome, do that. It's ultimately up to you to know in your body and in your mind what is providing benefit to you. Unfortunately, we do not have equitable access to alternate forms of treatment in our society. This means that for some people, if they choose not to use medications, they may not have access to other resources and things can get really bad for them. These are often the individuals that end up in situations where they're being forced to take psychiatric medications against their will. Those decisions where people are put on medication orders are not easy decisions to make. I don't envy the professionals that have to make those choices, and I think we need to continue to think critically about how we can create a society where people are able to access the treatment that's going to work for them and are not forced into interventions that have potentially damaging side effects. At the end of the day, forcing people to take medications isn't good, and telling people that they shouldn't take medications that they want to take isn't good either. This is why it needs to be about choice. R.D. Lang said, madness need not be all breakdown. It may also be breakthrough. It is potential liberation as well as enslavement and existential death. As humans, we want things to fit into neat little categories. We want it to be black or white, yes or no, good or bad. And unfortunately, this isn't one of those things. Mental illness and human beings are really, really complicated. We need to allow that space for complexity and nuance and listen to people when they tell us their stories. In closing, I'm going to leave you with five tips when it comes to supporting people in their mental health. Tip number one, support people in choosing what works for them. Each individual knows themselves best and they know what they've tried, what's worked and what hasn't worked. As a friend, as a professional, you can support people by listening to them when they tell you what works for them. Tip number two, don't give unsolicited advice. <laughs> if you find yourself compelled to give advice to someone when they haven't asked for it, consider holding your tongue. Number three, sit with a cognitive dissonance when things don't all make sense and they aren't black and white. Allow something to be both good and bad all at the same time. Number four, have empathy. Try to really listen to someone's story and feel what it is that they are trying to get across when they tell you their experience. Number five, fight for economic equality. Until our society can provide economic equality and stability for all individuals, it's going to be really hard to treat mental illness. Because newsflash, a lot of mental illness is caused by having an unstable environment, such as when you're poor or you're experiencing systemic racism or ableism or any number of other types of oppression. Until we address what's sick about our society, we're going to have issues that trickle down into the individual. It was Krishnamurti who said, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. I know this is a difficult topic and it's important that we have nuanced discussion about it. So thank you for listening to my video today. And if you liked it, don't forget to subscribe. If you have thoughts, dissent, comments, concerns, feel free to write me below and I'm happy to chat. Thanks again and we'll see you next time.